The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 12078 in the name of James Dornan on 100 years of Langside Library. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. And I'd be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I call on James Dornan to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Thanks very much, President Officer. Uh, I'd also I'd like to thank those who have signed the motion and those who are going to take part in the debate tonight. I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome to the Parliament uh, Lauren McNaught, the Cultural Services Officer, and Marky DeLeve from Langside Library, who travelled through this afternoon after an incredibly busy day to listen to the debate. President Officer, I've been privileged to have a number of members' debates since my election in 2011, but I can honestly say I don't think there's one yet that gives me the personal satisfaction that this one does. You see, I have a secret obsession, although it's not that secret for those that know me well. I'm obsessed with libraries. Something I'm sure I share with my colleague, uh, ex-librarian and uh, acting minister for children and young people. Ever since I was a child, reading has been my pleasure. Anything in the house. My mum was an avid reader, and so there was always something, normally Agatha Christie. And then when I was old enough, seven or eight maybe, I went to the library for the first time. Wow. Don't speak, stop shuffling, coughing, sneezing. All these rules, yeah, it was like Alibaba's cave of treasure, and I never looked back. I was fortunate to live close to uh, a number of libraries, Cooper Institute, Govan Hill, Kings Park, and of course, Langside Library, and that was my favorite. This library was the last library built with funds from Andrew Carnegie. Nearly all of Carnegie's 2,509 libraries, which were built between 1883 and 1929, were built according to the Carnegie formula. In determining where to build a library, the town or area needed to fulfill four key requirements. Demonstrate the need for a public library, provide the building site, annually provide 10% of the cost of the library's construction to support its operation, and provide free service to all. Like me, Carnegie had been greatly influenced by his local library and the opportunity that it gave for working boys, who some believe should not even be entitled to books to better themselves. Carnegie's personal experience as an immigrant to, to America, who came by his wealth with the assistance of others, helped him believe that society should be based on merit and that those who worked hard could become successful. This philosophical tenet ran through all his charitable works, but it's his libraries that is the best known expression of this philosophy. Langside was able to meet the requirements necessary, and after George Simpson won the competition to design it, work commenced on building it in 1913, opened in 1915. Whilst we now take whiling hours away browsing the shelves of a local library for our latest book for granted, it wasn't always this way. Langside Library was the first library in Glasgow to allow folk to pick their own books instead of requesting them from the staff. This was an enormous innovation and gave ownership and freedom to the members of the public to select whatever they saw that took their fancy. Although I suspect if you still had to order them, Fifty Shades of Grey, etc., would probably be slightly less popular than it appears to be. President Officer, Langside is famous for being the site of the Battle of Langside, the last battle fought by Mary Queen of Scots. It was defeat in this battle that led to her fleeing for sanctuary with her cousin Elizabeth, the first in England, and we all know how well that turned out. The battle is commemorated in a large painting inside the library, designed by Maurice Greffenhagen and painted with students at the Glasgow School of Art. It was exhibited at the Royal Academy of London in 1919 and presented to the library in 1920. This stunning painting is now being assessed for restoration. I want libraries to continue to inspire people young and old as much as it inspired me when I was younger. Langside Library is just one example of a library that's had a stellar history, but that is also modernising to ensure that it has a strong future ahead of it. One of the ways that it's doing this is by making it into a social hub and an area for the community to go get help and advice on a number of different issues. Citizens Advice have a drop-in service, as well as Macmillan Cancer, which are helping people in different ways and utilising the space that the library has. It also hosts a weekly coffee morning, storytelling sessions and bounce and rhyme sessions for parents with toddlers. Library service appreciate that by getting people involved in the local libraries, that they will continue to use them for generations to come. <laughs> Presiding officer, this morning I attended an event in Langside Library to celebrate the 100 years since it opened, 3rd of February 1915. And among the people speaking at it were local resident actor Gary Lewis. Gary told us he used to work in Easter House Library, and when they get requests for books they didn't stock, they sent to Langside for it. Honestly, libraries are just like Google come to life. I'm one of those saddest who would get excited when they came across a library they'd never been in. 
who couldn't walk past one in the off chance that they had got new books in since the last time I was there, which would probably have been less than a week beforehand. Libraries have changed. They're no longer that austere, serious, studious place they used to be. Everything goes on in the libraries now, from toddlers singing to the more mature, discussing old memories when the reminiscence box <coughs> comes out. And another thing I've noticed, the staff seem much younger now. <laughs> Maybe that's just me getting the young policeman syndrome all the same. But the most important thing about libraries remain the same. They're a place of wonder, hidden treasures for people of all ages. Incredible knowledge just waiting for you to turn a page and find it. But also fun, exhilarating and hugely rewarding. When Lord Provost opened the library back in the day, he said that this was as important to the working man as lighting or sanitation. Why? Because where else could the ordinary working man get access to what we have here? He also said that the library was about more than just books and lending, but could and should be the centre of the community. Interestingly, I was talking to a number of high rankers from Glasgow Life today who remarked on how, 100 years later, their purpose is exactly the same. And I know Glasgow Life are in the process of a review to strengthen further those links with the community. President Officer, I, I've said in this motion that it's ch these changes to Langside Library that's made the library more accessible, utilised the space and offered more than just the opportunity to borrow books, as vital as that service is. And I'm looking forward to hearing from colleagues across the country about the great example of other local libraries working in their communities. And if their libraries are half as beautiful or half as welcoming as Langside Library is, then this will be a very enjoyable debate indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes or so. I call Liz Smith to be followed by Drew Smith. Thank you, Deputy Providing Officer. And can I commend James Dorn? Uh, for bringing this debate to the Chamber. And can I apologise on two counts? Uh, firstly, that I was given extremely short notice uh, that I was taking part in this debate. And secondly, I have another engagement in about half an hour, so I'm afraid I have to leave before the end of the debate. I don't think I can say that I'm obsessed uh, with libraries, but I, I do uh, value them uh, hugely. In fact, I think libraries are perhaps one of the greatest assets within any community uh, for a whole variety of reasons and celebrating their work I think is an important uh, duty of any elected member uh, not least because they are so preciously regarded by the majority of our constituents. As is indicated in uh, the motion Langside Library is one of the last to be built with the funds from Andrew Carnegie. The first Carnegie Library in the United Kingdom was actually built in the constituency area which I represent uh, in his hometown of Dunfermline uh, and that was in 1883. His legacy of uh, philanthropy in this particular area can be felt, uh, I think, in somewhere over 2,500 locations across the world, from Langside to Louisiana, from New York to New Zealand. And he was clearly a Scot who conquered uh, the business world, then used that success, undoubted success, to bring community learning to those uh, who needed it most. And it's a legacy of which I think Scotland can be immensely proud. The revolution that Carnegie created has clearly changed over time, but it is just as important as ever as libraries have transformed from silent spaces of reading to bustling hubs of activity covering all aspects of community living. And as been pointed out by James Dornan, uh, I think that uh, activity is so incredibly important uh, for these local communities because libraries now host uh, free classes and events for local people, uh, some of which would obviously not have been available uh, when they first began. Uh, James Dornan also referred to the fact that there were uh, four criteria on which uh, these libraries uh, had to receive their funding. I think that's uh, uh, absolutely vital. I think perhaps the two most important were the fact that they had to be free for access and that they had to demonstrate that the community was greatly in need of a facility, which probably uh, was a little easier to do in 19th century Scotland than it might be now. Revolutionary though he was, not even Carnegie could have predicted the seismic shift that has been brought about by the internet. However, the proliferation of digital communication has been braced wholeheartedly across Scotland and by the Scottish library system, with many people's first interaction with the internet actually taking place in a library. Today, the majority of us carrying the entirety of human knowledge in our pockets and bags, smartphones and tablets mean that we have instant access uh, to information and therefore 
the increasing role which libraries have to play is a difficult one for them because they're obviously competing uh, with these new changes. But I have to compliment uh, libraries, uh, at least the ones that I know anything about. I think they have been absolutely outstanding in the way that they have approached this. Because I think the nature of our interaction and the need for uh, libraries is on an ever-changing uh, basis. But they have responded to that, as have communities uh, who have obviously a, a vital role when it comes to developing our uh, facilities. So I think the Parliament can rightly congratulate Langside Library today. 100 years is truly a milestone worth making. And for a century, the people of Langside have obviously been extremely well served. So can I just end by wishing their staff and visitors the very best as they embark on the coming week of their celebratory events. Thank you very much. I now call Drew Smith to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, President Officer. Can I, I begin by declaring my interest as a card-carrying member of Glasgow's uh, library services uh, and, like Liz Smith, uh, thank James Donnan for securing this debate and indeed congratulate the staff and the regular readers over the years at Langside as we mark uh, the centenary of Langside Library. I was pleased to support Mr Donan's uh, motion when it was lodged and I did read with interest about some of the, the information that he contained within it. Um, he mentioned, of course, the Battle of, of uh, Langside and that's... Uh, you know, it's, it's such an important event, but I think actually not that many people know that much about the detail of, of the battle. We know much more about the flight to Dumbarton and obviously the exile um, that followed after Langside. But it does seem fitting, um, given that connection, um, to be marking the centenary of uh, the library um, in Holyrood. Um, I've no doubt that generations of school children in uh, that part of the city uh, will have learned about, um, about uh, Langside's connection with uh, many Queen of Scots through the local library, but they've also have learned um, many other things besides. And importantly, they'll have gained, um, I think as Mr Donan himself indicated, a love of learning um, itself and for its own sake through their reading uh, and indeed the work of the library staff over many years. And I think it's important that, that we thank not just uh, the staff who currently work in the library, but remember the generations uh, of staff who have worked in that library and no doubt loved it uh, very much um, indeed. Um, I was also interested to read this another point that Mr Dornan uh, highlighted, that it was the first library in the city um, which allowed readers to take their own books uh, off their shelves. I'm intrigued by that, and I, I think there must have been so many interesting uh, discussions about allowing that um, to happen um, for the first time. But again, there's something very fitting about that, I think, um, given that the history of learning in Glasgow in particular is so much the, the history of, of self-taught uh, 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 learning and, the, uh, again, thinking of the generations of people who have used the city's library services to um, understand more about the world, to understand their place in the world, and particularly in Glasgow's history, to understand how to change um, uh, the world. Uh, and our municipal libraries will appear a, a, an absolutely crucial role in that. Um, as Smith mentioned, un libraries uh, you know, have undergone significant change. Some have been uh, lost altogether as a result of technology, cheaper books, and of course other forms of entertainment. Um, but you know, we have to acknowledge that another driver of that negative change is the pressure on local government budgets. And I understand that across Scotland, uh, 22 public libraries have closed since 2008. Um, so we do need to reflect on the modern libraries which are succeeding uh, and which have reinvented themselves as demand and expectations uh, upon them have changed. And the motion makes a number of uh, points about the services which are now offered at Langside. And the one um, that certainly I know best is the partnership between, all the, between the City's Library Service and Macmillan uh, Cancer, which provides a one-stop shop really for advice and information for those affected by cancer um, in a community rather than uh, a health setting. Like Mr Donan, if I reflect on uh, my own learning as a child, and probably along with uh, the BBC, my own local library was pretty much my primary exposure to uh, new information. The regular visits, uh, which both my parents encouraged me from a young age, did lead to a lifelong love of earning and a, and a wider interest in um, both local and Scottish history and inevitably, of course, politics. Um, so, you know, one of my fondest memories of my own local library was as a child being taken uh, by my grandfather, who was an ex-miner, um, to visit this wonderful model that uh, we had in the library of the local colliery, um, which was set up in the library. Um, and it had intricate details of the pit windings, and you could press buttons that lit up different parts of the pit in the underground um, railway. And it was quite a contrast to the, you know, the, uh, the decline of the real mine, um, which sat behind uh, my school and had uh, was fallen into disrepair following the, the closure at the end of the strike. 
And in that, that same library, um, I read a copy of Margaret Thatcher's memoir, The Downing Street Years, um, which was certainly priced beyond my years, uh, beyond my means, and was unlikely to be a welcome addition uh, uh, in my house, if any of us had sought to buy it, but um, I read it with interest. I also read uh, Robert Tressel's The uh, uh, Ragged Trousers Ph Philanthropist uh, in my library. I've got my own motion down uh, marking the centenary of that book's um, publication, and no doubt it would have been one of the um, books that was regularly taken off the shelves in Langside Library over the years. But there was much other lighter material, you know, uh, too. Um, the back catalogue of Enid Blyton, um, of course. Uh, the Three Investigators was the detective series for boys, um, which I worked my way through um, at my local library and, and many other things. Besides, and uh, Liz Smith mentioned this, but certainly it was in my local library that I first uh, used the internet. Um, you were able to withdraw uh, VHS films and even CDs um, at one time in the local library, which was a boon if you lived in a small town uh, without a record shop and you could uh, um, take the CDs home and tape them. But I would never um, encourage that uh, now as a supporter of the right of artists uh, to be paid. I would certainly deprecate um, that crime now, but it, it was a huge part uh, of, of my life, presiding officer, and I should wind up. Uh, and I would do so just by saying that I think libraries are um, precious things. And I don't, although they face um, real challenges, I think it's right um, that we mark the success uh, when it exists in somewhere like Langside, because they do continue to provide a real hub for the local community as well as uh, crucially, and I, I think that the, the motion says it's a gateway um, to learning for local history, culture and even uh, health improvement. And I'm grateful to you, President Officer, and I'm particularly grateful to Mr Donnan for ensuring uh, this important uh, motion is debated in Parliament this evening. Thank you very much. And I now call Christine Graham to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I congratulate my colleague on securing this debate and the Dean Langside Library on its centenary and preface my remarks by confessing I have not had the opportunity to visit Langside Library, but recognise the diverse services it provides for the community, reflecting the services in my own constituency. Early visits to libraries in my youth involved crossing the threshold of a quite forbidding place. It had the silence of a sanctuary where you felt even a sneeze was heretical. As a working class girl, I had no idea where to look, what to look for, and was too inhibited to ask, can you remember me being inhibited? But it was there that I first stumbled across critiques of Shakespeare plays. I had no idea they existed till then, and I passed my higher English with an A pass, self-taught by those library books. As an English teacher, however, my experience of the school library at Woodmill Dunfermline, under the formidable oversight of librarian Dorothy Devlin, was indeed eye-opening. This was the 60s, and she ensured her library, though respected, was a place of interest where conversations, albeit sotto voce, could take place. We even shared lessons on teaching children how to use the library, something I had never known, particularly those who were not academically inclined and felt like a fish out of water. I've had regards for librarians ever since, particularly as I recall she fought for so-called unsuitable books to be available. Freedom of expression and thought was her mantra, and she won't be the first or the last librarian to take on that fight. Today, I do surgeries in Newton Grange and Gore Bridge libraries, and both the most approachable and enthusiastic staff work there. This is not just because I'm greeted with a cup of coffee and a biscuit, but because of all they do to make the libraries inviting and diverse. There is a computer room, Kiddies Corner, seasonal displays of books and pictures. They both go to town at Halloween and Christmas. There are charity events and competitions and newspapers to read, flowers on the counter. Even me, it's all go. There is the surprise parcel enticement. A batch of books is bundled up in brown paper and string with a category labelled romance or thrillers. You pick your parcel and off you go to unwrap it home and perhaps find a book or two you would never have thought of choosing. Indeed, last time at Gorebridge while waiting for customers, I was perched among the autobiographies and to pass the time, I picked up David Jason's autobiography, being a fan of both Fools and Horses and Frost. It's a laugh a page, and I mean an out loud laugh a page. Unfortunately, I didn't get the chance to finish it, but after telling a few friends, I managed to get a copy for Christmas. I recommend it on a dreek day by the fire, possibly with a malt to hand. So I thank James Dorner for praising Langside Library and recognising that Langside, like many other libraries, has evolved into a really exciting place, very amenable, very approachable over the centuries. 
and make a diverse contribution to their communities, and indeed the librarians, who are the personalities who make them so worthwhile to visit. And can I just say, presiding officer, I like the touch and feel of a book. You'll never get me reading an e-book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, in the open part of the debate, Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you very much, and good evening, presiding officer. I would like to thank James, James Dornan for bringing this debate today and to also congratulate Langside Library on its 100th anniversary. I particularly want to thank James because I think that James has got the essence of the whole concept about libraries. I would have never imagined James going into libraries as regularly as he suggests he does. And that's wonderful. That's, that's very positive. Because I think that, you know, growing up as a child, uh, my, my, my family took me overseas and I didn't really experience libraries overseas because there weren't any there. Uh, and when I came back to Glasgow, I first time experienced a library because I was taken by my local school. And I said to myself, my God, look at all these books. And I can get them for free. I can actually take them home. I couldn't believe my eyes and my mind. So I took some home and I began to read them. And, you know, it doesn't amaze, it amazes me even today that the value that those libraries have for our youngsters as well as others in our community. And when I used to go to the library in the early days, it was always, I felt, everybody was elderly. It's just I was young, and so everybody looked elderly to me. But as time went on, uh, I felt the library's value was greater and greater as time went on, particularly when I went to university. I was unemployed at the time, before I joined university, so I was uh, not particularly wealthy. And I needed to buy books for my course, and I said to myself, I'm never going to be able to afford these. And I sat back, and I was told by one of the lecturers, well, you can go to the university library and get some there, and which I did. But what was amazing was, when I wanted to do, to do the research, it was the libraries that came to my rescue in my local area. It's amazing about the information that's available in libraries. People can't even fathom that. My grandson thinks that tutor is better than a dictionary. And I tried to explain to him, well, you need to know how to learn, how to use a dictionary, just in case you go somewhere in the world where there isn't, uh, what they call it, um, Google. And he said to me, Granddad, if they don't have Google, they won't have a library, uh, they won't have a dictionary either. So there are, there are challenges that face libraries today. Now, one of the things that I've, I've felt and I've noticed is the populations are moving around and some libraries find themselves out of space, out of gap. There is a gap between where the community lives and where the library is. And that's a challenge for the libraries as well as us in the community because there's a danger of us actually losing some of those libraries. And I would very much hope that the cabinet secretary might make a comment about trying to encourage schools to house some of those libraries so we don't lose those libraries. And that they would then be hand in glove in the sense that the school children would be able to use the library as well as the local community. I'm happy to do so. Very James Dornan. It's very interesting you say that because one of the local primary schools today, Mount Florida Primary School, told me that they were installing or reinstalling, I suppose, a library in their school with the help of Langside Library. So. Hans Alamalik. Yeah, that's, that's a fanta fantastic example. And that's exactly what I'm trying to, to suggest as well. Because I've seen, when I became the chair of lifelong learning in the Glasgow City Council, one of the things I wanted to introduce was computers. And I started off with a small pilot project in five libraries in Glasgow. And everybody said to me, you know, you're wasting your time. Everybody's got a PC in the house. But, you know, they were a phenomenal hit. It, it, it just brought home the message that no, people do use technology, people do want to use the facilities in the libraries if they have the opportunity. So therefore we rolled the whole program out and I think Glasgow City Council are, um, have been very good in trying to support that type of innovation. But I think what I would like to see more of is libraries being placed closer to the communities that can actually use them. Presiding officer, I know I'm running out of time, but there was a lot I wanted to say about libraries because I genuinely feel and believe that this is a, a service that we can do without. And I think that we need to reflect the time and the challenges that libraries face. And once again, I, I thank James Dorman for bringing this because hopefully it will I'll, I'll encourage the cabinet secretary to take on some of the ideas that are being suggested today and encourage the continuation 
of building on the heritage that we already have in Scotland. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And can I now invite uh, Fiona Hislop to respond to the debate cabinet secretary around seven minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, firstly, I'd like to congratulate James Dornan for securing this member's debate. The motion highlights the long history of libraries in Scotland and the most immeasurable impact they have on our lives. There's an opportunity to see wonderful buildings, experience works of art, and perhaps most importantly, in providing access for all to a timeless treasury of great literature. And it's for these reasons and many more that I believe that this is an important issue to debate in this parliament. Um, James Dornan referred to the Battle of Langside as the MSP for Langside, uh, the last battle of Mary, Queen of Scots. I reply as Cabinet Secretary, but I am the MSP for Linlithgow, where Mary, Queen of Scots was born. So perhaps I'm bookending uh, this debate uh, rather suitably. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to wish Langside Library a happy 100th birthday. It is a wonderful to see that after a centenary, the library is still going strong, bringing new services and sessions to its community, ranging from, as we've heard, practical support from Macmillan Cancer Support and Citizen Advice, local political engagements via surgeries with councillors and MSPs, to more leisurely pursuits such as storytelling sessions, coffee mornings and a knitting group. The ethos of libraries has always been a quality of opportunity, and this is as relevant today as it was 100 years ago. Libraries offer crucial support to help people help themselves, to support literacy, digital participation, learning, employability, health, culture and leisure, to improve the quality of people's lives and support them to engage in the democratic process. Indeed, only yesterday at the Sports, Art, uh, Arts and Culture Working Group, I co-chair with COSLA, councillors from across Scotland, uh, Glasgow, aren't currently participating, so they weren't there. Uh, but these councillors talked with passion about their belief in, uh, the, their belief in uh, libraries and their transformational role, uh, but also the transformation they are themselves undertaking for the 21st century uh, to maintain their role at the heart of the community. And as we were discussing um, at that meeting yesterday, how national and local government can best work together to support libraries. But I would caution members, as much as it is easy to reminisce about libraries, it's really important that we actually refer to libraries as they here and now in the 21st century. Uh, we in uh, the Scottish Government are supporting the Scottish Library and Information Council to offer leadership to the sector, recognising that they have a role in providing services, wider services, uh, but of course their responsibility for libraries lies with local authorities. We've supported SLIC as it works with partners to develop a strategy for public libraries in Scotland. The strategy group is chaired by the CEO of the Carnegie UK Trust, Martin Evans, and is an opportunity for local authorities and other partners to agree a clear vision for the future of public library services. And that was what we were discussing only yesterday. And libraries play a key role in supporting government policy in many areas. I'll highlight two on the digital agenda. We're uh, committed to increasing digital participation, and libraries play an important role in this, providing equipment and internet access for those who don't have it, training and ensuring those um, can get online who need to get online. We've provided SLIC with £300,000, which is supporting 138 libraries to install or improve Wi-Fi in their building. And this is in addition to the half a million pounds annual public library improvement fund we provide to SLIC uh, to support various projects across Scotland, ranging from World War I projects to Lego reading clubs for young readers. The second area where libraries make a significant impact is in the development of good literacy skills. The Scottish Government recognises that we need those skills and the Literary Action Plan highlights the importance of reading as a valued activity from an early age and the benefits in the home. And obviously a lot of those issues are about that issue about equality and opportunity that has been a theme of many of the speeches today. Um, obviously tackling uh, areas with the low, lowest levels of literacy and breaking the well evidenced link between poverty and deprivation and poor literacy skills. So the plan's delivery and impact has been overseen by the Standing Literacy Commission, who met for the final time in December, and they will produce a final report on the Literacy Action Plan in the spring. Obviously, we also have a, a key role for libraries in the Read, Write, Count Literacy and Numeracy campaign for primary one to threes, and the campaign will build on the success of Play, Talk, Read, and of course, Bookbug in the uh, early years. 
Book Week Scotland, of course, also promotes reading to all ages across Scotland and libraries, deliver much of the activity during the week. In 2014, Book Week Scotland saw approximately 481 events in libraries uh, across all local authorities, 17,000 people attending them. There's a real vibrancy uh, in, amongst uh, the activity in libraries, and we must recognise that. And during Book Week Scotland, the Scottish Book Trust invited everyone to send a love letter to their library, and the message was one of love and appreciation. And as one young reader put it, and I quote, Thank you for helping my brain to grow, for opening up my imagination and giving me dreams, helping me to learn to read and find out new things. And we're better to encourage reading than in public libraries, which remain one of the free universal services that operate at the heart of communities across Scotland. 30% of adults in Scotland use their library, and libraries remain the most frequently attended cultural venue, with almost 7 out of 10 visiting their library more than once a month. So perhaps one thing that libraries could do better is to market themselves, remind people of all that they have to offer and what they do for people all over the country. Saturday the 7th of February is National Libraries Day across, um, uh, across the country and I think we should all look for opportunities to promote the work of libraries on that day to demonstrate their services are valued within our communities. And as James Dornan's motion recognises, our libraries are part of our history and remain a vital part of our communities. Their offer is universal and democratic. Free access to books, reading, internet, public space, information, cultural, historic and learning opportunities are all vital in building a fairer, smarter, healthier and wealthier Scotland. And I want to, to bring my remarks to a close in, in uh, quoting uh, Andrew Carnegie. And he said, there is no, not such a cradle of democracy upon the earth as the free public library. This republic of letters, where neither rank, office, nor wealth receives the slightest consideration. Presiding officer, my local library as a child was my own personal republic, uh, where I felt empowered and first independent as an individual. And I see the light of liberation in my own 10-year-old son's eyes when he talks about his experience with the library. So libraries are not just about the history, they are about the present and they are certainly about the future. And although, yes, libraries are about the physical buildings and, yes, the books, they are also so much about the people who serve and continue to serve in them. So in closing, presiding officer, I salute all the people who have worked in Langside Library over those hundred years, and I salute those who still work in Langside Library. Many thanks. That concludes James Donnan's debate, 100 years of Langside Library, and I now close this meeting of Parliament.